Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glendivit Books. With the news from Kabul increasingly uncertain, unclear, confusing and contradictory, and last night extremely distressing, the question in everyone's mind is what should we make of the situation? How should we understand what's happening to Afghanistan? That's the key issue I shall explore today with the chief executive of the Mobi Group, the group that owns... Afghanistan's highly internationally acclaimed and domestically very popular Tolo TV, Saad Mosseni. Mr. Mosseni, let me start with last night's dreadful bombs. Perhaps as many as 92, 93 people have been killed, maybe up to 200 injured. ISIS Khorasan has accepted responsibility, and ISIS, as you know, is neither a friend of the Taliban nor of the Americans. In fact, both look upon ISIS as enemies. And secondly, this shows that even after 12 days, the Taliban does not have effective security control on the capital. Doesn't that mean that the situation is much more complex, complicated and difficult this morning than we thought it would be over the last 12 days? Absolutely. Um, for, 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 for most Afghans, this is Groundhog Day. The Taliban are the new... Ashraf Ghani and ISIS is the new Taliban, and uh, it's it's the pain, suffering, destruction continues for most Afghans. Uh, the Taliban certainly we, we knew uh, this um, uh, from the beginning that uh, they lack the capacity in terms of policing the country. Uh, this city of seven million people was probably uh, one seventh of the size in two thousand and one. Uh, it's a much more complicated uh, uh, city. Uh, the country is more complicated uh, to start off with, and especially with this 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 disaster, this this avoidable disaster at the airport. Uh, it would be difficult for anyone to police uh, the situation, uh, let alone a, a, a group of militias who've descended on the city, uh, quite not prepared to run things. Can I quickly pick up on that last point? The threat from ISIS, if anything is going to grow and escalate. Does the Taliban have the capacity, the competence to actually handle it? Particularly when after the 31st, European, NATO and American troops will be gone. Absolutely not. I, I think they recognize that. I mean, some, some individuals within the Taliban recognize that they lack the capacity. They need help. They need help from, from both uh, Afghans as well as uh, our international partners in terms of intelligence and capacity building uh, and, and, and so forth. And the conundrum, I think, for a lot of Western countries, and uh, you saw the news that the CIA chief uh, met with Mullah Barada a couple of days ago on Monday in, in, in Kabul, is that you know, you're damned if you help them and you're dam damned if you don't. Um, by helping them, do you, rec do you sort of inadvertently recognize them? And if you don't help them, the situation could really go get out of hand. And the Taliban and, and ISIS and Al-Qaeda, but in particular ISIS, could take advantage of this vacuum and really uh, uh, push. And uh, I know there's been some fighting in the east of the country and uh, ISIS has managed to kill a lot of Taliban fighters. And it's, it's been underreported, only it's because it's difficult to verify. And these actions in Kabul indicate that not only, not only are they there, but they're more... Um, in, in some ways, uh, just as effective or even more effective than they were a few months back. Against that background, tell me, what is the mood of Kabul today? Yesterday, I heard a New York Times correspondent tell the BBC that despite the chaotic scenes at the airport, the city was calm and people were trying to lead their normal lives. But after last night's disaster, does that calmness continue? Are people still trying to lead a normal life or are they now very scared, if not petrified? Uh, to, to, be, to be fair to, to the quote unquote uh, uh, calm people of Kabul, they're mostly calm and quiet because they're not sure. They're scared. They're nervous. Uh, a lot of the shops are still closed. The banks are closed. Uh, uh, you know, there are no effectively the dollar is in, in uh, the Afghanis in a free fall against the dollar. It's actually even difficult to convert right now because most of the uh, money changers uh, have opted to, to, uh, to not be involved in any sort of commerce or trade. Um, so I think it's the, the, the calmness can be a bit deceptive, but in reality, people are afraid. They're not sure. You see, the thing about the Taliban, you have to remember their brand 
is uh, safe, uh, honest, and can keep the peace. You know, they, they have this brand. They're not particularly sophisticated, but most people have assumed that when they take charge, that the place will at least be at peace. Uh, people have commented like, well, we can travel from the north and south of the country that where the Taliban rule, and we're not seeing any issues, it's safe. But this sort of bursts the, the myth of the Taliban, um, and it's going to be very damaging for them. And I think that they would be cognizant of that uh, and probably quite nervous. Tell me something. Last week, we heard reports from the United Nations that the Taliban were going door to door searching for people who worked with either NATO or America. Deutsche Welle claimed that close relatives of one of their producers had been either injured or brutally murdered. Amnesty claimed that the Taliban had killed six Hazaras in the Ghazni area. This week so far, we haven't heard similar reports. But what is the situation on the ground? Does it continue the way it was last week? Is there any perceptible improvement? Or, or are people just staying indoors to keep safe because they don't trust themselves and the Taliban when they go out? <laughs> it's probably all of the above. Um, I think um, in terms of door-to-door -door searches, uh, I'm not sure if they were institutionally endorsed uh, searches of, of houses and so forth. I think that a lot of Taliban did go into uh, the dwellings or offices of, uh, of people affiliated with the government or associated with the government or government employees. They confiscated state uh, assets like vehicles and weapons and so forth. And I think that some Taliban members also confiscated vehicles for themselves. They actually even moved into facilities or buildings that didn't belong to the state, like the American University of Afghanistan, which is a privately funded institution and a, the pride and joy of, uh, of, of many uh, Afghans as well as uh, our international friends, uh, has now been occupied by the sort of local Tal Taliban force since last week. But I think the Taliban did try to uh, warn their soldiers, warn their militia, uh, militias not to do that. And I think we've seen less of that this week than last week. Also, the checkpoints and so forth, there were a lot more last week. This week, they have less. Um, in terms of uh, reporters getting hassled, yes, I think uh, sporadic uh, attacks against reporters we've seen all over the place, including our own reporter and, and, a, and a cameraman who was beaten up two days ago in Choroi or Jiokub, which is literally a kilometer away from our office. They were out uh, to, to get vox pops, speaking to laborers, looking for job, for work. Um, a land cruiser showed up, beat them up, confiscated their camera, uh, microphone, and mobile phones. The Taliban have promised to look into it. They're trying to find our equipment. Um, they're embarrassed by it. So, But it also shows that the leadership is not in full control. Uh, either they're not in full control or they're allowing this to happen. And both are pretty bad news for most Afghans. You're referring, of course, to your reporter Ziyari Yad Khan, who got beaten up yesterday on the streets of Kabul. And that brings me to the subject of what 12 days of Taliban control mean for journalism and in particular for Tolo TV. Let's first talk about your news and current affairs. I'll come to your very popular serial entertainment and music programming after that. But from the point of view of news and current affairs, what has 12 days of Taliban control meant? Uh, well, one thing for sure, no clarity. Uh, the Taliban have not taken over fully. They don't have a cabinet. Uh, we don't know what their laws like, uh, what laws in relation to media and entertainment and music and so forth will look like. We haven't had received any directives from them. Mm -hmm. So that lack of clarity, of, of course, is disturbing. They have given certain indications, like, for example, they've said that music is not Islamic. So we expect music programs uh, to not be permitted under, under a um, Taliban rule, assuming that you know, that they, they, it's a full-on Taliban government. It's not a coalition government. Um, so it's too early to say how they're going to treat the media. For now, you know, we, we, we're taking baby steps and we're putting some programs back on, especially entertainment programs, not music, but some uh, drama series, uh, chat shows, which would include female uh, as well as male uh, presenters. Um, and we'll see how that goes. 
you know, this, this lack of clarity is very disturbing. However, they have given us assurances that in terms of news and current affairs, that they're not going to be restrictive. And even right now, we talk to people in Panjshir who are opposing the government. We're talking to Taliban supporters. We're talking to opposition figures based outside the country. We're talking to women activists inside the country, outside the country, some critical, some supportive of the Taliban. So far, they have not attempted to limit what we can put out. What you said at the end is very heartening, that you are able to talk to resistance leaders in Panjshir. Yesterday, the BBC carried a pretty fiery and defiant interview with Amrullah Saleh. Can I understand that if you wanted to carry something similar on your channel, you would be permitted? Or would this be something you'd think twice about because it might be unwise? No, of course. Of course. I think bits of that interview we're going to air today if we haven't already. In other words, you're going to air bits of the BBC interview, that very defiant, fiery interview that I referred to. Yes, and we've heard uh, Ahmed Massoud's uh, comments and, you know, and there are people from both sides commenting on this issue. There was actually a big, uh, well, it was a round table with one person supporting the Taliban regime and the other person supporting uh, Ahmed Massoud's uh, efforts and Panjshir. Uh, not quite screaming at each other, but having a pretty healthy debate on Tolo TV last night. This is very important. I'm going to underline it for the audience because it's not the perception people have in India or even internationally of the Taliban. Up till now, they are permitting Tolo television to carry their staunchest opponents who are determined to resist and fight against them, including Ahmad Shah Masood's son. And later today, you hope to carry an interview that Amrullah Saleh gave the BBC where he was swearing that he would never surrender and he would continue to fight. That is an important indication that suggests that at least in one important respect, Taliban 2.0 is different to Taliban 1.0. Am I jumping to a hasty conclusion or does this follow from what you said? Well, I think I think we see what we have to understand. The Taliban right now are, are scrambling to consolidate their rule over the country. To they're attempting to win over political as well as military opposition. Three, they're trying to win the support or endorsement of uh, of international potential partners or international players. And fourth, they're trying to win hearts and minds. So. For them, those are the priorities, and they may very well be leaving the media alone because they know that being too restrictive this early could backfire. Or they may not have the bandwidth to deal with the media. You need people. You need to monitor things. So I, I don't want us to assume anything just yet. I think we have to, that remains to be seen. Um, so far, so good, but it's early, too early for us to jump to any conclusion. Absolutely. One has to see whether this tolerance, this acceptance of dissent continues at the moment, there are very good reasons why it would suit Taliban to present this more reasonable face to the world. What about women anchors and women reporters? Are they still reasonably free? Have there been more instances like that first occasion when a Taliban leader gave an interview in studio to one of your women anchors? Has that happened again and again? Or was that a one-off? Well, it, well, the sad thing is that we've also lost a lot of reporters because they've had the opportunity to leave, and th- which they have. Um, so we've lost about 70, 70 or 80 employees just the last 10, 12 days. Um, uh, we obviously uh, cannot uh, ask them to stay back because we're not sure of uh, what the future holds for them or for Afghanistan. So we've had to... So we've suffered in the sense that we've lost a lot of capacity within our organization, including a lot of our female presenters and journalists. So we're hiring and we've hired another two female journalists who will hopefully start presenting uh, various programs in the coming days. So we'll see as Taliban officials come into the studios as to whether they're still prepared to talk to or be, you know, be questioned by female journalists that, remains to be seen in terms of having women on the street and so forth you saw the incident a few days ago when our journalists were uh, beaten i think we, we we have to remain very mindful of how violent it can still get in kabul because these militias these taliban militias are not you know they they, they have no expertise in policing a city um you know this ragtag of you know different militias from different parts of the country 
they have different clothes, they speak differently, they have different attitudes. So for the Taliban, before they can standardize their entire police force, I, I think it's, things are going to be pretty dicey. What about the entertainment side of Tolo television? Your Turkish serials were widely watched and hugely popular. Your music programs were extremely popular. Do they continue? Are you a little cautious about putting them out and feeling your way? Which of the two? Well, we, yes, we, have, uh, we are cautious and we, we've pulled uh, all our music programs. Uh, we're certain that they will not be acceptable to, to the Taliban. So we've erred on the cautious side. Uh, music clips are not as important as, as our news stories. So if we had to make a choice, we'd rather pull those stories. And plus, people can just download them from YouTube. Um, and, uh, and soap operas, we've kept some on. The period dramas are on. Our chat shows are starting to come back on again. Um, our children's programs are back on. So we took a lot of things on. We had a lot of repeat, uh, repeats of pre period dramas, particular Turkish ones, and some local dramas. But we're starting to produce fresh content. Um, so what we have now is, is sort of more on the, you know, repeat side, but I think starting uh, tomorrow, actually, we're going to have a lot of fresh content. The morning program will be on, various panel programs will be on, various uh, period dramas will be back on, uh, some kids' programs will be back on. Uh, music, probably not, and I don't think they will allow music, because I think uh, Zabulon Mujahid, the spokesperson at this most recent press conference, indicated that music... Uh, 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 contradicted um, the Sharia and therefore uh, they would not allow music shows. To sum up this bit of the interview, I get the feeling that you're making a very determined, purposeful effort to continue being a normal television channel with chat shows, soap operas, with news programs, with an opportunity to the opposition, including Taliban opponents, to speak openly. You're feeling your way day to day, with the exception of music programs, where Zabayullah Mujahid has explicitly said they're not part of Sharia. Elsewhere, you're sensing each day what is permissible as well as what is wise. Well, I'm sure they're going to issue directives, uh, so they'll make our job easier uh, when, they, when they're in charge, officially. In the meantime, uh, we've made, we've had to make certain decisions. We have 400, 500 employees on the ground. Uh, continuity for us is really important. I said to someone the other day, I said, you know, many, many, many things will be taken away from the Afghans, um, their economy, um, democracy, perhaps women's rights. But the thing that we, we can contribute to and we can, uh, we can ensure is that, that 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 hope is not taken away from them. And for them, media has been a sort of beacon of hope over the last two decades. So uh, you know, us being able to continue is going to be a very important thing. Uh, we will have our red lines. I mean, uh, obviously, if we get pushed into a corner and we know that it's going to be futile for us to continue, then we will pull out. Um, although I'm pretty confident we can continue from outside the country. Uh, people are engaged. People watch media. You know, especially the younger population are totally connected. Uh, so whether we're based inside or outside, I think we will. People will continue to follow what we what we broadcast um, via via satellite, via online, or even via terrestrial, which is the way we get to people's homes today. This but is we have to make some options. Sorry, please carry on. I interrupted accidentally. No, no, but we have to make some decisions, and uh, and you know there there are some 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 decisions such as cancelling certain shows and keeping other shows on. Those are practical decisions that, let's be honest, television channels all over the world make. Uh, it's not unusual. The heartening thing is that you're making every effort as a television channel to continue like a normal one, broadcasting your normal programs. And up till now, and this is a very important point, the Taliban has allowed even dissenters and opponents from Panjshir to appear. And today you hope to carry part of that interview that Amrullah Saleh gave the BBC where he was defiant about opposing the Taliban. Let's briefly talk about not television and journalism, but what 12 days of Taliban control mean for the people in the country. When 
The Taliban first came, Zabayullah Mujahid said that there would be no discrimination against women. But recently he's begun to say that women should stay at home and not go to work because he's worried the Taliban itself may mistreat them. He wants security and measures in place to protect them. Do you see his second position as sensible caution or the first hint that the Taliban is sliding back to its old traditional position of denying women their rights and their freedoms? Which of the two? It's hard to tell uh, because, see, the Taliban also have to navigate uh, what, their, what the demands of their constituencies are, which is a more restrictive environment, and what the majority of Afghans and the international community is demanding, which is less restrictive. You have to understand that even at their peak, the Taliban, their approval rating has probably never been above 10 or 15%. Let's just say 15% tops. Um, of course, the Afghan government has also been very unpopular. So the Afghan nations had to deal with two very unpopular political movements, um, a corrupt, inept government, which was not very restrictive, but yet, you know, the Taliban, who are much better in terms of governance uh, and, 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 and corruption and so forth and keeping the areas under control safe and uh, stable, but very restrictive. Um, so for the Taliban also, it's going to be important to navigate this, these two different terrains and, and not losing their supporters because, you know, it's very possible for the, for the movement to fragment or for, for people to jump ship and join ISIS or Al-Qaeda or some other group. So they also have their own challenges going forward. I think what Zabila Mujahid says, it probably makes sense because, it, I mean, Kabul is not safe, as we've experienced uh, over the last few days. Uh, their foot soldiers are not particularly disciplined. Uh, they're illiterate. Uh, they come from the villages. I mean, for them, the Kabul experience is an extraordinary experience. They, they just can't, cannot probably believe the big buildings and the paved roads and the traffic and the population. So it makes sense. But, you know, that restriction only applies to government, uh, all, you know, government employees, not to the private sector, not to... NGOs, not to diplomatic uh, missions. But the challenge we have is how do you convince a guy stopping your car that this lady who's going to work, who's working for us, is not a government employee? Will he even understand the difference between a government employee and a private sector employee? So these are, these are things that we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis. That's very true. Now, 48 hours ago, the German ambassador in Kabul said that he'd met Sher Mohammed Stanikzai and been assured by Mr. Stanikzai that even after the 31st, Afghans with documents would be free to leave the country. But in the last 24 hours, there's a long list of countries that have said they are stopping evacuation immediately or at the latest by the close of today. That list includes France, Germany, Britain, Canada, Belgium, Netherlands, and Spain. And then once the Americans are gone, who's going to technically manage the airport or who's going to maintain security? So with all these problems and question marks, what happens to Afghans who have documents and have a right to go abroad? They may technically, as the German ambassador says, have permission, but physically they won't be able to do so. This is a you know, one trillion dollar question, you know, how do we deal with the, with this immediate uh, humanitarian crisis? I mean, the Taliban, well, Afghanistan has, we have to deal with three crises, the political one, which we're all witnessing, the humanitarian one. We, we have six, 700,000 in, internally displaced people that this current government has to deal with. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the economic crisis. So I, I, I I've written a, an op-ed uh, which, uh, which was published in this morning's Financial Times, and I've argued that right now, right now, the world uh, has to feel compelled to engage the Taliban, to help them with these issues. So there, there's a window of opportunity to entice them to moderate their policies and to use the carrots of assistance and perhaps recognition down the road as, as levers uh, in order for, for, the, for the regime to moderate its approach on women or minorities 
uh, human rights and freedom of expression and various other issues, values that we all share. And I think this also should extend to the Indians. I mean, the Indians should also engage. The Indians, uh, probably in terms of, if you were to poll Afghans today, Indians would have to be in the top three in terms of countries most trusted and most liked. And, and I think the Taliban are going to be pragmatic, at least for a period. My concern is if they're not engaged and if they're cornered, they will snap. And they will go back to what they feel most comfortable in, which is to have a Khmer Rouge type regime where they have a very dogmatic view of things. And they think the best way to deal with Afghanistan would be to completely come down on the local populations in terms of movement in the city, in terms of working and in terms of religious um, issues. And I think that this window of opportunity, there's, there's a very narrow path that if we don't take advantage of this in the coming week, that opportunity could be lost forever. You're saying something very, very important. I'm underlining it. You're saying there's a window of opportunity that may not last more than a week for the world to engage. And you also believe part of that world has to be India because you said it's the, one of the three most cu trusted countries. But if that window is closed and the world fails to engage economically, politically, and in other ways, then you fear that the Taliban could end up like the Khmer Rouge. That is a dreadful prospect because everyone remembers the killing fields and what Khmer Rouge did to old Cambodia. You really believe that is a likely prospect? I mean, look at the city of Kabul, 7 million people. Look at the scenes at the airport. I mean, unless you do something dramatic and really cause violence, those people are not going to move away from the airport. And, and for the Taliban, policing is, is an expertise. They don't have that, lack, that capacity lacks, you know, in Kabul right now. So the only option they have is either they engage uh, members of the old guard, which is what we've argued about, which is a broad-based government that's inclusive, and to use or to rely on their international or Afghanistan's historic international partners, uh, like the Americans, like the Germans, like the Brits, like the Indians and others, uh, on intelligence and capacity building and so forth. I mean, as ironic as this sounds, the Taliban need the international community to help them better govern in a lot of ways. And they have to rely on... Uh, former officers of, of the Ministry of Interior and, and, and Intelligence, as well as as well as the Defense Ministry, in order to be able to, be able to better police the cities and towns of Afghanistan. This ragtag army of, of militias who are good for small villages in the south and the east of the country don't have the capacity to deliver in terms of gov governance in our major cities. It's a nation of 38 million people. It was 21 million in 2001. It's a vastly different country and people's expectations are also very different. You know, you said the world should engage. One question that will appear in the minds of many hearing your advice is that two Afghans who've been traditionally very close to the West and particularly close to India, I'm talking of Karzai and I'm talking of Abdullah Abdullah are reported by CNN to be under house arrest. Their security has been withdrawn. And initially, those know, were I, people we thought who were talking to the Haqqanis, talking to the Pakistani hmm. ambassador, talking to the governor of Kabul. Now it seems they're under house arrest. I, I don't know if that's, well, it's it, 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 just the way you interpret it. They have not had their security taken away from them. They still have their security. They have their vehicles. Um, I, I, think, I think the Taliban, and probably it's not a, it's uh, it's not unwise. The Taliban have asked them not to limit their movements within the city because they're not sure um, what the security situation situation is like, and they cannot guarantee their safety. So they have asked both uh, President Karzai and Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, who's staying actually staying at Dr. both staying at Dr. Abdullah's house, to limit their movements within the city because they cannot guarantee their safety. And after the the tragedy of yesterday, there may be a point. Um, I mean, for the Taliban, what difference would it make if they go to, they can meet anyone anyway. They can get on phone calls. I speak to them almost daily. They can do interviews. So whether they physically move, you know, move from one house to another house is, is not a big deal. I think the security aspect is important. 
I mean, they may very well not leave, allow them to leave the city, but, uh, but, but I think those reports are perhaps slightly exaggerated. I'm very glad to hear that. And I'm very glad that you've given us a more correct idea of how both Mr. Karza and Mr. Abdullah, we're coming to the end of this interview, but I want to put to you two thoughts that I think are particularly important. First, Afghanistan today in 2021 is a very different country to the one that the Taliban ruled in the mid 1990s. As you said, pretty close to 60% of the population was born after 2001 when the Taliban was thrown out. 18 is the median age of the population. And these are young Afghans who are accustomed to democracy, social media, social mixing, television entertainment. And I imagine that's pretty true of the young fighters with the Taliban as well. How conscious are both sides of this? Well, I mean, I, I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. I think that, uh, I think even the Taliban realized that. Uh, for them, they now own Afghanistan and they have to start delivering. They have to start delivering on the economy, on governance, on security. And, and I'm not saying that the, 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 the tragedy of yesterday has burst their myth forever, but it also shows, well, to both the world and the Taliban leadership and the people of Afghanistan, this is not going to be easy for them. And I hope that this is, this is a reminder to their leadership that they cannot do this alone. And they have to engage with our other Afghans, including Ahmed Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah, but also many, many other Afghans who've decided to stay in the country. We've lost, and we will perhaps lose two or 300,000 of our best um, in, the coming, in the coming days. However, another 35 odd million people will stay in the country and they have a responsibility uh, to do this, but they cannot do this on their own. And if that penny doesn't drop, then we're all pretty doomed. The other question is to do with the resistance in the Panjshir Valley. I was delighted when you said that you're able to talk to them, interview them, arrange discussions with people like Amrullah Saleh and Emma Chamasud son. But can that resistance in the Panjshir really threaten the Taliban? Or is it just a matter of time? Despite their verbal defiance, the Panjshir resistance will be overcome. We don't know. I mean, they're in discussions. They've had they had a delegation in Kabul yesterday morning, and they've had you know delegations going back and forth between the two sides, and they've also been in discussions over the telephone. Right. Listen, the problem with the previous government was uh, that no one was willing to die for Ashraf Ghani and his government. A lot of people who opted to not fight the Taliban did it because they thought and they were given assurances that they would be would be left alone. If this government doesn't serve their interests and becomes dictatorial and goes about its business, like we discussed before, very inclusive, almost like a Khmer Rouge type dictatorial um, uh, uh, style of, of, of running the country, then I think a lot of these people will rise up. And I think that this is, it's, it's, Afghanistan is far more complicated than how it's painted outside. The fact that the, the Taliban, their ascendancy can, can, cannot just be explained by the fact that they were better um, uh, on, on the battlefields. It's also because most people acquiesced to the Taliban taking over and most communities decided not to support the local forces and most local forces did not fight. But but, but, they, but they have given this government, and we'll give it a bit of time, but we'll reassess. And Afghans can quickly change their minds. And the Taliban's rule over the country is far from absolute. And how they behave, and how, you know, not just towards the Panjshiris and the people gathered in the Panjshir Valley today, but also towards the other opposition figures and minorities will determine what's going to happen in the months ahead. You referred to the Charikar talks. The BBC seems to suggest that there is a real possibility both the Panjshiris and the Taliban could come to some sort of agreement. David Loyne, the scholar from Aberystwyth, spoke particularly that he's been told by people within the Taliban that there is a possibility of an understanding. Do you believe that is really possible or is this just journalistic speculation? No, I think it's very possible. I think that... Uh, 
both sides realize you know the futility in fighting this and i think you know those guys in pancher we're talking about four or five thousand fighters of which i think more than half are special former special forces guys they have heavy weapons they have helicopters uh, they have a lot of ammunition um it's not some ragtag army of villagers it's a proper fighting force and they could inflict real damage to the taliban i mean if you look at even like in helman helman held on to the last minute because they had the special forces guys it was only a, a few hundred they held on to probably the most taliban province or at least the the center of the most taliban province uh for for months uh, so uh, and they were totally exposed the city of lashkar is exposed from all sides panchir is a bit different uh, the terrain is very difficult uh, they have local support and if you have that much ammunition and that much many fighters I, it's going to be i'm not saying it's impossible it's going to be very hard for the taliban to conquer that uh, area by force and also for this side for for the for the anti taliban force gathered in the panchir they may not also want to you know flex their muscles now they may need time so both sides may be buying time and this peace deal would give provide them with cover and if if perhaps perhaps the taliban really soften their stance uh, and are um, intent on adopting a more inclusive approach and bringing someone like ahmad masood into kabul don't forget uh, ahmad Mas- ahmad masood is probably the more influential of all the political players inside the city of uh, inside the province of Panchir because of his dad, then that could be a win-win for everyone. My very last question. In a recent interview that you did for the Indian paper, The Hindu, you said India's blunder was that it supported individuals rather than Afghanistan. They doubled down on a few individuals and backed them to the hilt. And I presume you were talking about people like Abdullah Abdullah and Hamid Karzai. But then you went on to say Some no, I, I, I don't mean that. I think there were other people. I think they were. I think, to be honest with you, the Indians had turned off Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah because both of them were were um, seemed to distance themselves so, uh, from the from the Indian government. I think there were other people. There were warlords. There was perhaps the vice president. There were other people. I, you know, listen. At the end of the day, India's had a relationship with the Afghan people, and I think it needs to continue doing that, no matter who's in charge in Kabul. That is the important point on which you ended that Hindu article. You said, and I'm quoting, the Indians ought to become a little bit more aggressive in terms of their outreach with the folks in Kabul today. It is important for India to think long term. What do you mean by that phrase, the folks in Kabul today? Is it the Taliban who control Kabul, or is it the people of the city, and beyond that, the people of the country? Well, I think the people of the country, but the way to get to them is uh, through the government of Afghanistan. Right now, it's the Taliban, and maybe in three weeks it will be a more broad-based government. But, but I think, you know, the assumption that the Taliban, even this Taliban, even the sort of victorious Taliban who've been based out of Pakistan with all their sanctuaries and hospitals and so forth, even this Taliban, I think, will be receptive to overtures from India. Uh, because they would want to balance their reliance on Pakistan, um, and I think, you know, there's something about the air in Kabul. I always joke that as soon as you enter it, your views change, in particular vis-a-vis Pakistan. That is a very important point you're making because I hope there are members of the Indian government and certainly of the Indian Foreign Service listening. You're saying even this Taliban would be receptive to overtures from India. And then you add it because they want to balance their dependence on Pakistan, and therefore it is in India's interest to drop its hesitation, reservations, and let me be honest, its prejudice about the Taliban and reach out. Taliban is a reality. You now need to find a way of establishing a relationship with them. That, that's correct. At the end of the day, Afghans don't want to be told. Uh, to do, uh, they, they don't want to be told by anyone um, to do the things that they're asked to do, and that also applies to Pakistan. I think that any anyone with a didactic uh, attitude towards Afghans will find that quickly enough that, that there'll be pushback, and I think some people in Pakistan will be surprised in the in the months and weeks ahead.
Mr. Mosseini, this has been a fascinating interview. You've opened the eyes of the audience to the bigger picture, the reality behind the surface image, not just about the Taliban and ISIS, but also about the views and thinking of the Afghan people and how, if the world does not find this one week opportunity, a moment to reach out to the Taliban and help them, then unfortunately the Taliban could end up becoming like the Khmer Rouge and Kabul and worse still Afghanistan, like Cambodia. There is a tragedy that can be averted, but time to do so is short, limited and running up. I thank you for this. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you for your time.